for this morning is one verse from Psalm 34. That's verse 8, so we'll read that one more time. Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. After the sermon, we will sing from this psalm. Psalm 34, stanzas 3, 4, and 7. Psalm 34, stanzas 3, 4, and 7. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, some years ago, I had the blessing of being able to serve as a chaplain at Campfire. And that's a Christian camp in Ontario, very beloved in our church community there. It's quite similar, as I understand, to Stepping Stones in BC. And there was a line that would be repeated many times a day throughout the week. During devotions, during activities, it was sort of the slogan for the week. And that was, God is good all the time. God is good all the time. It was something that was repeated many, many times a day. What a beautiful saying to chisel into the hearts of young children of God. Of all the things that should be called to mind, especially during trials and challenges and times of pain and sadness, what should we remember and be assured of? God is good. He's good all the time. God will never set aside his goodness to discipline us or teach us. God does not pause his goodness, even when he does things that are hard to understand. He doesn't put a stop on his goodness when he acts as a judge or when he deals harshly with evil. God is good at all times. And this is particularly comforting for those who belong to him, who have been assured of God's great love for us. We're able to enjoy his goodness. We are able to recognize, see his goodness with our own eyes, feel it in our lives, enjoy it, and to praise him and worship him because of how good we know he is. So our theme for this morning is that God is good all the time. We'll see two aspects of this. First of all, we are able to experience his goodness. And secondly, we will never be apart from his goodness. So first of all, we will be able to experience, or we are able to experience his goodness. The psalm that we read together, Psalm 34, has a superscription above it, as was mentioned. It describes the setting of David's writing of this psalm, and we read that setting together from 1 Samuel 21. David, this is before he became king, Saul was still king at the time. David's life was in very great danger because Saul was looking for him in order to kill him. And so Saul had, had fled from Saul's presence. He received provisions, and then he fled to Gath in the land of the Philistines. Gath was Goliath's hometown, the Philistine city, and he found himself in great danger there too. As we read, the Philistine king, his servants warned him about David when David arrived there. Hold on a second. What's he doing here? Isn't this the famous David that the people of Israel are singing all those songs about? We should be, we should be careful with him. David may be a major threat to us. They sing that song, David or Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. David is a dangerous warrior. For Samuel 21, verse 12, David hears about what's being spoken about him. And we read there, David took these words to heart 
and was much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. His life is in danger from all sides. It seems like there is absolutely nowhere for him to turn. And we have the story of how David was delivered from danger through acting like a madman in front of the king. But David gives the credit for his salvation to God. We read there in Psalm 34, verses 4 through 7, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 6, he's talking about himself here. This poor man cried. So he's in a state of trouble. He's in danger. He's afraid for his life. He cries out to God. Verse 6, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. David's life has been saved by the Lord his God. And after experiencing the wonderful saving help of God, David, in verses 1 through 3, David is praising the Lord. The Lord has been so good to me, I will bless the Lord at all times, in verse 1 there. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Verse 3, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. David has arrived to a state of incredible joyful worship, And he's inviting the rest of God's people to worship God, join him in worshiping the Lord just as he is. David says, come, come with me, taste and see, experience the goodness of God for yourself as I have. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What an invitation that is, isn't it? David isn't just saying, I'm going to tell you a story. I've experienced the goodness of God, and I'm going to tell you all about it, and you know, I'll describe some things, and you just take my word for it and let that be good enough. Like This isn't, this isn't just theoretical. This isn't just reading stuff about God and saying, wow, that's, that's very neat and remarkable. No. He's inviting us to taste what he has tasted. That's a big difference. You think of the difference between, you know, a friend of yours describing this amazing slice of apple pie that they just had. Best apple pie in the world, still steaming from the oven, served with a dollop of vanilla ice cream next to it, and the heat from the pie is starting to turn the ice cream into this sauce that goes, you get the idea. Your friend is describing this to you. It sounds pretty good, and it's, and it's very nice, and maybe even quite pleasant to hear someone give you such a vivid description. But how much better would it be if your friend said, I just had the world's best apple pie, and guess what? I have a piece for you. Taste it. Taste and see how good it is. Then you really know. You don't have to wonder. You get to experience it yourself. This is what David is doing. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. Experience. Really experience the goodness of God. That's quite an ambitious thing. Quite an ambitious thing to experience the sum total of all of the perfections of God. That's how one theologian defines the goodness of God. And we actually have something similar to that in in Belgian Confession, Article 1. This beautiful description of who God is. God is a simple and spiritual being. He is eternal, incomprehensible. He's invisible, immutable, infinite, almighty, perfectly wise, just, and what does it end with? He is good and the overflowing fountain of all good. God's goodness is the sum total of all of the perfections, the attributes of God. We can really experience that? Wow. 
How can we do that? David says how we are able to do that. Verse 11, come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. That's how. Be instructed to fear the Lord. What does that mean? What does it mean to fear God? Well, it, for us, it doesn't mean to, to tremble and be terrified, although there is good reason for that for anyone who is an enemy of God. There's that famous line from C.S. Lewis in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The, the children are, are very nervous about meeting the lion, Aslan, and they say, you know, I don't know about meeting a lion. Is he safe? And the answer was, no, of course he isn't safe. He's a lion, but he's good. He's good. In the same way, yes, God isn't to be trifled with. He's God. He is to be feared because he is God. Verse 16 and Psalm 34, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Those who hate the righteous will be condemned. God is a just judge, and if anyone is still in their sins, then this is a terrifying thing, to fall into the hands of the living God. Our sins make us deserve total condemnation. What a, what a horrible thought that is. But David here has experienced the saving help of God. David, in his time of great danger, he cried out to God for help. David trusted God. God heard him and delivered him and, and took care of him. Right? That's also what it means to fear God, to learn who God is, spend time learning the character of God, the love of God, and as a fruit of that, to surrender completely to him in love and in trust, to worship him with your whole heart, soul, and mind. That is to fear God. How does one come to such a state of having that kind of love and trust and complete, complete dependence upon God? Well, that comes from knowing God through Jesus Christ. How can you know? How can you be assured and, and completely confident that God will be good to you and that he will treat you kindly, caring for you with absolutely perfect and divine care. Well, by seeing what he has already done out of his great love for those who are his. Romans 5, 8 through 10, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is how much God loves those who belong to him. He sent his son for our salvation so that we could be returned to him as his children. Verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. We are able to know the goodness of God when we look at our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Christ and see all of the magnificence of God. His wisdom, His justice, His love, His goodness. God has proven his great love by giving us his son Jesus Christ, not only for the forgiveness of our sins, not just so that we could be made clean and, and sort of put back at square one and, you know, try again, but no, 
He's given his son Jesus Christ to us so that he could be our good shepherd who tends us with his care, who feeds us and protects us all the days of our lives. In the past little while, many of you have experienced great hardship. There have been many illnesses and injuries, states of sadness in our congregation. Life is, is hard and full of pain and, and suffering. Some of you have loved ones, you know, your children and, and their families who are going through tremendous hardship and you hate to see your children suffer like they are. And it's especially in these times that you must be assured of God's goodness. You must be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you know His ways, when you know our God, you know the kinds of things that He does and the kinds of trials and temptations that He gives to those who are His, then you are able to recognize His providential care during that hardship. And His goodness, even in that, is never doubted. Think of someone who was diagnosed with cancer, but even in the middle of all of that hardship, was able to see all of the remarkable ways that God was providing for everything. You know, from the surprising, unexpected circumstances that led to an early diagnosis, wow, it just so happened. No, God was watching over you, providing for you. All kinds of seemingly little ways that God showed His presence and assured them that He was watching and caring. Psalm 34, verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and His ears toward their cry. And the result of this, of experiencing the goodness of God, especially in times of trouble and and feeling His help and, and, and experiencing His his care, the result of that is, is worship. The result of God's care for David was worship. All of this stuff was happening to him. The Lord delivered him. And what is his response? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And let us do this together. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. A desire to worship the Lord and praise the Lord with others. Share the experience of God's goodness. You can say to one another, let me tell you, let me tell you what I have tasted. And invite them to taste the same thing. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. And this is always the case. God's goodness is not here one day and then absent the next. We will never be apart from his goodness. That's our second point. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. We rejoice, we are, we are glad that it is possible to truly experience the goodness of God and anyone who trustfully seeks out the goodness of God is assured that they will be blessed at all times. Verses 9 and 10, O fear the Lord, you his saints, those who fear him have no lack The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. That is a powerful thing to believe. I would imagine that all of us here sometimes, or or maybe even often, take a look at our lives and, and think about what our 
life is like, what the condition of it is, and we think about, you know, the parts that maybe aren't so pleasant, and we might think, you know, if only this were changed. You know, life, life would be better, you know, life would be a little better, maybe even much better, if only such and such would be given. Something is lacking. Something is lacking. Maybe it's financial struggle. I'm lacking the resources, the finances to do, to do X, whatever it is. Or maybe it's health. If, if good health were given, then life would be better. I'm supposed to have better health and, I, and I'm lacking it. Or whatever it is. If only such and such a thing were given, then life would be better. What are we saying with that? Life would be more blessed? Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Nothing. There is nothing lacking somehow. If we have taken refuge in God, the God of our salvation, then the fact of the matter is we receive absolutely everything we need from the hand of our Father in heaven in perfect time and in perfect measure. Whatever it is, even though we cannot understand it all the time, it is perfectly tailored for your life. It is tailored for each one of us so that we draw nearer to God, so that we are taught to walk in His ways, taught to more and more trust in Him as our Father, to depend on Him, and to receive all things that we need from Him and Him alone. What did Jesus teach us in Matthew 7? This is verses 9 through 11. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to good, good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? In other words, do not doubt it. God is supplying everything as your heavenly Father. He has given you his Son to be your good shepherd through the woes and cares of life. He leads you beside quiet waters. Now, today, he does. He makes you lie down in green pastures. He restores your soul. He is never apart from you. At all times, you are receiving the blessings of God the Father through your good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is good all the time. Amen.